First Sergeant Kep here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. And I thought tonight while I was down in the shop working on a repair, I would take you along for the journey. Um, a lot of us in the hobby like to use you know, antique or original items and for a lot of it's for authenticity, but sometimes you can find some pretty old or beat up items and you may think, well, uh, it's not in good shape, it's broken, I can't use it. Um, and so I figured, well, if I can show you a few tricks, you might be able to save yourself some money, resurrect an old tool, and improve your impression fairly affordably. And so what I'm working on here tonight is an old, de-handled, uh, sort of scooper style shovel. Now out here in the Pacific Northwest where we're at, these style of handles and shovels are intensely rare. Um, so when I saw this thing sitting outside in the rain at one of my favorite antique stores, uh, I grabbed it, walked inside, and they only wanted $10 for it. Now, out here, that is an amazing deal. It is not uncommon to find these de-handled shovels out here in the Northwest for as much as $80 in an antique store regardless of condition. It's crazy. So I didn't need it, but I figured, you know what? I can I can fix this up and have it ready in case someone wanted to buy it off of me. And it's always nice to have an extra shovel and I enjoy restoring old tools. So I brought this home. I let it dry out in my shop for a couple weeks because and this thing was wringing wet. And once it dried off, I started removing the rust. I used a medium, medium fine wire wheel. Um, and remove the rust while preserving as much of the patina as I reasonably could. I want all the rust gone, but um, I'm also not doing some sort of like showroom restoration. I wanted to honor the history and beauty of this tool as best as I could while keeping it serviceable and removing the rust. Now, instead of using a wire wheel, you can also use different uh, chemical treatments to remove or convert the rust but the wire wheel on my little experimental piece worked out fantastic. Uh, once I had the rust removed, I had a tear in this shovel. It's only about three quarters of an inch long, um, but it needed to be repaired, otherwise it'd just keep tearing through use. So I cleaned up this edge uh, with a die grinder and tried to keep the repair spot as small as possible. I hammered everything back in alignment on my anvil, and then I welded it together. I think it only took like three or four tacks. And then I cleaned it, cleaned it up again with, a, uh, with grinders and a finally a nice uh, fine file so I can match the contours and blend it in on either side. So now this metal piece is completely structurally sound. And it gave me um, a sense of the quality of the steel that was remaining because sometimes you get antique tools and you don't know what life they had. Um, they could have been rusted and, and neglected to where the steel is no longer any good, in which point this is just kind of a wall hanger, if anything. But once I had the metal work done, I, uh, cleaned, it, I cleaned it up with some more WD-40 and I put a nice coat of boiled linseed oil on it. And so now I am ready to tackle the handle. Now, I've never seen a pristine or like antique de-handle shovel. Um, I'm sure if you're from back east and these are way more common, you probably have. Uh, but most of the time when you get an antique tool, you need to do some sort of repair or maintenance to, to get it back and serviceable. And one of the things that are super common with these old shovels is the handle is almost always split and you almost always have a split going down the grain into the handle to some extent. And I wanted to show you how I go about repairing these so you don't feel like, oh, well, that's no good, it's a broken shovel. It's like, well, we can repair it and you almost, unless you know what you're looking for, you'd never notice the repairs. And even if you have like deeper damage in the stock, how I repair these uh, can also build up the material a lot better and you can fine tune it and put this thing back to work. So I need to glue this wood back together to rebuild its structural integrity, and then I'll sand uh, it nice and smooth. It's actually not too bad, it weathered pretty well, but I'll sand it again and I'll have to sand down my repairs anyway, 
and then I'll hit it with numerous coats of boiled linseed oil. Uh, something this old and dry, or even if it's something new, I'll probably like thoroughly coat this thing every day for at least a week uh, to get it back and happy and pliable and ready to be back into service. So how do I go about repairing these cracks? Well, I do that with just some basic two-part epoxy. Uh, just about any woodworker is going to have some of this stuff or a lot of this stuff on hand, uh, especially if you're making tables or you do a lot of uh, slab work. We use this a lot to fill in knot holes and stuff like that so we can stabilize the wood. And I don't go through a ton of it, but I always keep some on hand for little repairs like this. So whatever brand you choose, and then depending on your crack, I recommend some sort of way to wedge the damage open. Um, because what we have to do is we, we're not just gonna seal you know, the edges, we need to drip this epoxy down inside the crack and let it uh, get all the way through before we clamp it up. And then the same thing down for the lower handle. So you'll want to do all of this prep uh, early. And don't stress if you hear it you know, crack a little bit. I mean, obviously you don't want to completely split it in half, but you want to have this thing as open as you safely can without completely destroying your piece uh, because you really need that epoxy to soak in there. And then you'll want some uh, masking tape this is just going to help you uh, save a lot of time on cleanup. So what I'll do is I'll take my masking tape and I'll tape, you know, fairly close to the crack. I'm, I'm not gonna stress it. I'm not like, painting a car or pinstriping or anything. So I'm gonna tape pretty close. So that way if I overshoot with my epoxy, I'll have less stuff to sand when I'm done. So I'll do my tape prep and start mixing my epoxy. And to do mix my epoxy, since I use it pretty often, I just get a bunch of these popsicle sticks, these disposable uh, mixing sticks. So let me get this going and I'll show you how I do it. My first tip before you start using epoxy, if you don't use this very much, or maybe this is your first time trying this out, um, these manufacturers have these stupid um, connected plungers so you can get even amounts, um, but it, it never seems to work evenly and then it completely removes your ability to dial in um, your ratios. Uh, so like, you know, if you say there's an air bubble on this side and you get a lot more here, then you can't really make up the difference. So what I always do when I get one of these new containers is I'll just stick this in my vise. I've even used my bandsaw before and I'll just uh, cut these plungers free of each other. So that way I have independent control of my mixing. Then I just cut the tops off. And then I'm going to mix up a healthy amount. Um, usually you're going to get a lot of epoxy seeping into some of these rather large cracks, but also don't feel like you need to do this all in one step. Let me, let me tilt you down a little bit. There we go. And so you can see I have my, probably a little bit more clear. Okay, I'll just pull back and set that aside and now I'm ready to mix. So like I was saying, um, you're, you're, you're going to need two or three goes at this one. Um, you'll probably repair the crack itself in uh, the first treatment, but you're, you might have um, voids, it might settle, it might seep further into the crack, which is great. Um, you may also have um, whole chunks of wood missing and you may have to build up your epoxy into several coats if you want everything to, to look nice, even, and smooth. So now I have my epoxy mixed and I'm going to start applying it. Try not to make a big mess. 
And as, as you get it in there, you want to really try to get it pressed in. And that's what I like about these popsicle sticks is I can use it to force the epoxy down into the crack. Now, if, if you know, if you're trying to match um, pigments or coloration, you can you can buy pigments to uh, dye your epoxy. Uh, black is usually pretty good because it blends in with uh, wood very well. I usually just run it clear. Uh, some people will mix in sawdust from the, the piece that they're trying to repair. So that will uh, match even more. But I've noticed that, you know, in my years of doing this, the repairs are almost invisible to the untrained eye because they work so well. And then once you darken the wood with linseed oil, it blends in even more. So I'm trying to get it all the way down, even to the, the fine cracks. And if you have like something that's really tough to kind of seep in there, uh, you can get um, something that's not five minute epoxy. So that way you're gonna have a longer open and working time. So now I'm going to flip this over and attack it from the other side. Now you may be you may be asking yourself, well, uh, why don't you know why not just use uh, wood glue? Uh, if you're if you're just trying to glue the pieces of wood back together, um, wood glue of course is going to work just fine, but it doesn't give you sort of the the, the build up ability that you can get with a two part epoxy. So if you're trying to build up the the structural integrity and fill in material, uh, epoxy is going to be uh, a much better choice every time. Okay, so now my wedges are in the way. Now it's time to pull them out. Keep feeding in the epoxy. Like I said, um, you don't have to fill the entire thing perfectly the first time. Um, almost every time I've done this, I've had at least, I've had to do at least one other treatment. And then if we get squeeze out, that's a good thing. It means we have complete coverage. So you can see I already loaded this up and you know the void already formed again. So that means this epoxy is seeping down into the wood. Okay. So now I have complete coverage. All the holes, I guess all the cracks are filled. And now it's just a matter of grabbing some clamps and clamping it together. Now on this handle, these handles have uh, support rods through, the, through them, and I want to try to avoid them the best I can because, I don't know if you can see it, but these, these rods, can you see that? Right there. These rods 
um, can prevent your clamps from compressing properly and give you a less than ideal glue up. And just use as many clamps as you feel you need. Once you have everything filled and clamped, all you have to do is let it dry. I have lots of squeeze out, which is excellent to see. Um, and the other nice thing about epoxy, especially on these old shovels, it looks like this shovel actually sealed up most of its cracks, but because of its age and the condition or maybe additional chipping of the wood over its lifespan, this epoxy is going to fill any gaps that there's just no longer any wood there. So if you have a, a split on the top of the handle, the epoxy is going to bridge that uh, where uh, wood glue wouldn't. Um, but everything else is looking pretty darn good. So now all you have to do is set this aside and let it dry. And then uh, once it uh, cures properly, um, make sure you use a some sort of sanding block to sand your piece with, just any piece of scrap wood. You can even use like an actual sanding block if you have one. Um, the reason to use a sanding block as you're trying to knock down your excess epoxy is so that you don't take off original material, material that you don't need to. So this will actually help you just take down the high spots left over by the um, epoxy while preserving as much surrounding wood as possible. So that way when that epoxy is down flush with the rest of the handle, then you can go in with your finer sandpapers and just blend it in seamlessly. Then you clean up the rest of the wood uh, with, you know, increasing uh, grits of sandpaper till it's nice and smooth or however you like it. Hit it with some linseed oil, let it dry, and it's ready for another generation of faithful service. So I hope this video has helped you. Um, let us know if you have any questions about any other sort of old timey tool repair and I'll see what I can do to give you a hand. Um, thanks as always for liking and subscribing and we'll see you next time.